Today's message is titled, Prayer 2. Last week, we talked about Prayer 1. I don't know if we're going to have a Prayer 3, but it might seem likely, because there's a universe of things to talk about with praying. I was searching this week, and I come across a, n- a handy list of scriptures that deal with the different type of prayers in the Bible. And they was all laid out kind of neat. It's on a site called um, Got Questions. It's a real good resource. And they're usually very, very good with this, and I, I use it quite a bit. But anyhow, this, these prayers, they went through and they found the scriptures for all the different types of prayers that we pray. And we're going to start with the prayer of faith. Prayer of faith. That's found in James 5, 15. It says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, there's a lot more that went ahead of that, and there's some that follows it, but that's pretty clear. The prayer of faith. Praying without faith, you might as well not even pray. Oh, and by the way, I've got these slides going. They're gonna, Don's got them rolling. Um, and there's going to be basically what we're talking about today. We're asking God to heal. We have to have faith. Every week, every week we ask God to heal. We have to have faith. It does not mean that God will heal everyone we pray for. I wish that was so. I pray for Matthew. You pray for Matthew. We prayed for Judy, Terry. We, we pray for each other. But we have to keep believing in the goodness of God, in God's plan, his purpose. We don't have to understand what God does. We have to trust him in what he does. This week, this last week, I was listening to little Annabeth say the blessing. When she's at the house, she's the blessing giver. When we say our night prayers, she's the night prayer giver. This girl is going to be a, a Bible-thumping pastor, I believe, because she's got a prayer that just won't stop. She prays for everybody and everything. If She just asks for name after name and, and asks for healing after healing. And, you know, she just prays with all of her heart. It did me so good hearing that. She's maturing into quite a little girl but our faith is in God our faith is in God's will we're told a story in Mark 9 21 to 24 now this is a new life version you might not see it it's a fairly new version that's out it um, supposedly runs really really close followed the Greek, and and they did a good job with this one, so I've been trying to use it some and get used to it. But it reads a lot easier than uh, King James does. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? The father said, from the time he was a child. Many times it throws him into the fire and into the water to kill him. If you can do anything to help us, take pity on us. Jesus said to him, why do you ask me that? The one who has faith can do all things. And at once the man father cried out. He said with tears in his eyes, Lord, I have faith. Help my weak faith be stronger. That's what we should pray for, stronger faith. You know, we're told we can move a mountain with the amount of a grain of a mustard seed. I want more. I want stronger faith. That's when we pray. Our faith is in God and God's will. We also do something we call corporate prayer or the prayer of agreement. Every week we do that together. A couple times. We do it with the Apostles' Creed. We do it when we say the Lord's Prayer. Um, We do it when we come together and pray over somebody when we lay hands upon them. That's corporate. That's all together. Okay? It's a prayer of agreement or corporate, whichever way you like it. 
And we're given the um, examples in the Bible in Acts 1, 14. All joined together constantly in prayer. And then in Acts uh, 2, 42. Later after Pentecost, the early church devoted themselves to prayer. That was praying together every day they met. They were a praying group. And the church grew and grew and grew and grew. We need to be a praying church. Philippians 4, 6 teaches, Do not uh, be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to God. Well, we do that with the prayer of request or supplication. We do that when we're asking God for something. Specifically, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to God. It doesn't say some of your requests. It doesn't say you got a limit of three today, two tomorrow. It says all your requests. I don't know about you, but I got a lot of needs in my life. I got a lot of needs in my, my spiritual life, my church life, family life. Every part of my life has needs. I have to ask God because he's the only one that can take away my anxiousness and give me peace. We're also given a part in winning the spiritual battle by prayer. Ephesians 6.18. This is the New King James Version. Praying always with all prayer and supplication to the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I like that. Now here's the new life version of the same thing. You must pray all the time as the Holy Spirit leads you to pray. Pray for the things that are needed. You must watch and keep on praying. Remember to pray for all Christians. Do we pray for all Christians all the time? Or do we have selective ones that we pray for? I don't know. Sometimes I'm pretty selective, I think. We need to be more generally praying. I heard a pastor on the TV this morning. We talk about TV pastors. and um, Oh, he's on the radio, actually. And uh, he says that Christians are the most persecuted people in the world. And that's true. There are people being killed right now for the name of Christ as we sit here and gather. We're persecuted. When you go to Matthew 24, we're all going to be persecuted. Then we got another type of prayer. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. We find many of these type of prayers of thanksgiving in the Psalms. And it's really closely related to the prayer of praise and worship. But the difference is, with the prayer of thanksgiving... We focus on what God has done. With the praise and uh, worship prayer, we focus on who God is. Now that's the difference. We want to make sure we focus on who God is, his nature, and we worship and we pray and we give him thanks. But we also need to acknowledge what he has done, how he has done it. Then there's the prayer of con uh, consecration. It's a solemn dedication to a special purpose or service. It literally means associated with the sacred. Acts 13, 2 and 3. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate me to uh, Barnabas, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. That was a calling when Barnabas and Saul was sent out by the church. They're consecrated for this. When someone is called from the pew to the pulpit, and every pastor has been called from the pew to the pulpit. But when somebody does that in the congregation, the congregation usually has that same practice. They will pray. We're Methodists, I don't know about the fasting part, but they will pray and they will send the person out. That's how I was sent out. 
I was sent out from Ivy Bluff like that. And I was sent out to be a separate ministry. Every time a congregation has someone that's called from the pew to the pulpit, they send them out. Sometimes we pray, we consecrate ourselves, setting ourselves apart to allow God to work his will. Jesus made such a prayer on the night that he, before his crucifixion. But he also made a prayer of complete submission to God's will, full obedience. Our prayers are really multifaceted. We generally have two or three or four different type things in our prayers. The three prayers that Jesus prayed in the Gospels about of um, account of Matthew 26, 36, and through 46. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he was arrested. Matthew 26, 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is po so possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I will, but your will. A little later, Jesus prays, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. He said these three basically the same prayers. Asking to have this cup removed, accepting God's will, and willing to obey, knowing full well what it was going to cost him. He was totally, totally submissive, and obedient to the will of God. Then we've got the prayer of intercession. This is a neat one. Many times we intercede for other people. We pray for other people. We intercede for their needs. When we pray for unspoken requests, we're interceding for other people. It's a prayer of intercession. When we pray for specific needs, it could be healing, but it could be that we need to pray for uh, changes in their life. We need to intercede, intercession. We're told to make intercession for everyone in 1 Timothy 2.1. Uh, Jesus serves as our guide in this area. The whole of John 17 is a prayer of Jesus on behalf of the disciples and all believers. Then you got the prayer of blessing. Jesus teaches us to pray for blessing on our enemies, not hate. It's a strange thing. The world hates the enemies. We're to pray for blessings on them. I think I struggle in that area sometimes. And the Bible also speaks of praying in the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15. And prayers when we're unable to think of the words, the Holy Spirit makes the request, the prayers. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Prayer in its simplest form is simply talking to God without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. As we grow in our love for Christ, we want to talk to him more. As we grow in our love for God, we want to talk to him more. As we grow in our love for the Holy Spirit, we want to feel the Holy Spirit working on our lives more. We want to be closer today than we were yesterday and closer tomorrow than we are today. We are to grow. It's like Judy's prayer. It's like what she wrote that touched me when I heard that. You know, she, look at her concerns. She was concerned. She wanted to be closer. But she also was concerned about her grandchildren, her church. She's concerned about her nation, her country. Now that is intercession. We've covered some of the ways that God wants us to pray. And I'm going to flip around 180 degrees now and go the other way. Many have made praying into something that God did not intend for us to do. What is that you're saying, Bob? Oh, no. God wants you to pray, but God doesn't want you to pray any old way. 
Like other aspects of this modern prayer movement, this charismatic church, these, I grinned in uh, Sunday school when we talked about TV preachers because a lot of them come up kind of under this category. Not all, but many. Um, it seems some folks have come up with their own brand of praying. I learned about some things that I knew nothing about this week. It's a good week when I can learn about things I don't know about, which is almost every week for me because I'm dumb as a rock. But when I can learn about something, it's a good thing. But did you know there's a thing called the soaking prayer? Me neither. It's practiced by many Christian denominations, I guess they'd fall under, at least they claim to be. And then there's the prophets, prophetic prayer, prophetic intercession. I'll get to each of them a little bit here. These are not found in the Bible. Nowhere. They seem, looking at them, to give the person that is actually doing the praying a higher status. Seems that it elevates them up. There is nobody elevated in God's eyes. He does not look at us different. He loves the most lost in the world as much as he loves the most saved in the world. His love does not change. We're all important to God. There's way too many others to tackle today. But I did want to look at these prophets. These self-imposed prophets believe that they're praying the very words of God into the world. When I do a message, I pray that God speaks through me. But I'm not saying God is giving me every word that I say. Or I wouldn't mispronounce so many doggone words. I am saying that the message has to be God-centered, has to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But these people take it a step further. They're saying that every word that comes out of their mouth, God is putting there. And people are to listen to it with the same thing that they listen to God speaking. That's cult. That is not biblical. These are self-styled prophets. I believe they believe, many of them, that they're delivering messages straight from God. I think many are under the great delusion. I think Satan has a lot of power over people, makes them believe things that aren't true. I believe some of them believe what they're doing is correct. Doesn't make it correct. Many times they come and they have new information. God has revealed this to me. On the 14th day of December in the year 2929. None of these dates ever come about that happen, but yet they will pronounce them. That God has revealed this to me. God has showed me this. God's not revealing anything new, people. The canon of the scriptures is closed. My Bible's complete. Revelation 22, 18, New King James Version. It's a warning. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. You can't add to God's word. You can't bring a new message. You can't bring a different gospel. Even if the angels come down and give you a different gospel, you can't give it. God has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only gospel that we have. These so-called prophets are trying to tell you something wrong. God has spoken through his word. 
We're told to do our job and understand his word. Jude 1, 3, New King James. Contend for the faith. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Our message, gospel, faith, has been delivered to the saints. There's nobody bringing us a new faith. Nobody bringing us a new message. Nobody bringing us a new part to the Bible. I'm not going to ask God because he will not tell me about his plans. Even the angels in heaven do not know when Jesus is coming back. And yet, you'll have people on this earth that will give you date, time, and location. No matter what anybody says, God has already given us all we need to know. That's in our Bible. Don't forget Satan has some power on this earth. He can cause delusion. He can cause people to believe things they should not believe. You know, he's not got a red cape and he doesn't have horns on his head. Don't have a big tail. He usually comes dressed up. Could be as a preacher. Could be as a teacher. Could be as a politician. Could be as somebody very wise. And he will twist people into not being saved. That's his job. Christ had a lot to say about these false prophets. Matthew 24, 24. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I am so glad Jesus added, if possible. Because it's not possible. We're told over and over again that we're safe in the hand of Jesus. What's placed in God's hand can't be lost. So he's saying, if it were possible, even the elect would believe it. That's how these delusions are going to be. But friends, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you will know what is the truth and what is a lie. I thank God for these warnings. We cannot be deceived. We have been told what to look for. The prayers of a prophet is usually described as the act of, and I'm quoting this one, act of commanding God's prophetic vision to be fulfilled in the earth with the result that God's will is accomplished. Let me repeat that. This is the description of this type of praying. Act of commanding God's prophetic vision to be fulfilled in the earth with a result that God's will is accomplished. This is taught in some charismatic ministries for bringing ju God's judgment upon this lost world. Only God knows the time of the judgment. We can't pray the judgment in. Now, can we pray that God returns soon? Sure. As we talked about again, in, you know, if you're not in Sunday school, you're missing a blessing. But we talked about it in Sunday school. Even the disciples, as Christ ascended, standing there looking up, ready for him to come right back. We've been looking for Jesus to come back since the moment he left. You know, an angel had to come down and boot him off the mountain, make him go back to work. So... Don't go selling everything. Don't go to a mountaintop. And don't go there saying, Come, O Lord Jesus, I command. You probably won't like the answer you get. Prophetic prayer is aimed at individuals so that they will supposedly fulfill their purpose or their will so that God's will can be accomplished. Jesus' prayer in Matthew 6, 9-13, nine, nine the Lord's Prayer, teaches us to submit to God's will, 
does not teach us that we possess powers to actualize God's will. God's plans will come exactly when he wants on his timetable. We find that all through the Bible. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Mark 13, Luke 12. God does not require any special proclaimed prophets to ensure God's will is done. God has that covered. When folks start demanding God's judgment to fall and his kingdom to come by the will of the prophet, that's arrogant. May border on blasphemy. It's real close if it ain't there. I read that with a fellow who was describing this ministry, and it made sense to me. He said it borders on blasphemy. The Lord is the one who will ensure that his will is done. Isaiah 46, 11. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. These prophets believe, they make an assumption, that God still appoints certain men and women to speak for him. These modern day prophets who can utter divine revelations with all the authority of God himself. I'm spending some time on this because it's a big thing out there. It is a big thing. Many people who should be sitting in this and churches like this are sitting in some of these mega churches listening to this type of thing, believing the person that's speaking is a prophet of God. People like Olstein are leading people to hell, not to heaven. He's not alone. Folks who develop their own personal religion are the ones that absolutely are the false prophets. Some of them point to Matthew 6.10 where Jesus says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They think that's their authority that they are prophets because they can pray for that. Well, we can pray for that, but I can't command it. I can't demand it. These folks take a couple of verses in the Bible and they make everything about what they want it to be. You have to take the whole Bible, all Scripture. Can't pick and choose Scripture. The New Life Version of Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, where Jesus is talking to the ones that are testing him. Jesus said to them, you are wrong because you do not know the holy writings or the power of God. You're wrong. You don't know scriptures. You don't know God's power. Being charitable towards these people I believe they're confused. I believe they're confused about God and Scripture. The Bible declares that God alone decides when, where, how he will act. We're to pray for him to act according to his perfect will, his timing, not ours. As much as I would love God to reach down and touch my Matthew today and raise him out of that bed, my prayers for God's will to be done. It's hard not to want to pray for my will, but I can't. I have to pray for God's will. So do you. No matter what your problems are, you have to pray for God's will. Sometimes these prophets believe that they're there to intercede for other people. And God does use people to help other people. He does. But not as a self-proclaimed prophet uttering words from God's mouth. We help other people by feeding them, listening to them, loving them, meeting whatever needs we can meet. Did I mention loving them? 
Let me mention that again. Loving them. Because after loving God first, Jesus said that's the most important thing we can do. Feeding them's good. Praying for them's good. Loving them is what we're required to do. Oh, and by the way, that's everyone, even your enemies. They believe they're a mediator between the person and God. They're mediating this need. But we know that's not true because there's only one mediator. That's Jesus Christ. Timothy 2.5 in the New King James Version. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Or the New Living Word says it's just a little bit different. I'm really liking this version. There is one God. There is one man standing between God and men. That man is Christ Jesus. That's who our mediator is. There is no other. There's no pastor. There's no counselor. There's no preacher. There's no prophet. There's nobody between you and God. Nobody has God's ear more than you have God's ear if you're a child of God. If you pray in faith, if you pray in faith for God's will to be done, that's all that's required. If your faith is centered on God's nature, his goodness, his love, whatever God does will be the right thing. God can never do the wrong thing. We don't have to understand I don't have to understand why Judy's not here, or Terry, or Matthew's in a coma. I don't have to understand it. I just have to trust God that that was God's right thing to do. And that is so hard. That is so hard. Let's go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for prayer. I thank you for ripping the curtain, Father for tearing the veil. Father, I thank you for allowing me to approach your throne. But I also thank you, Father, for allowing every other child of yours to approach your throne. I thank you that we each have that power to come directly to you, Father, for healing, for comfort, for mercy. I thank you, Father, that we're to bring all of our worries to you, all of our concerns to you, Father, our sicknesses, and eventually, Father, come home to you. We'll be resurrected. We'll have our new glorified body. And, Father, we'll be with you for eternity. Father, I look forward to that day in my life when I can hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. I look forward to the times in heaven and the reunions that will happen. But Father, until that time comes, I pray that you strengthen my faith, strengthen me physically, and allow me to keep serving you the way you would have me serve you, Father. Father, I pray that in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.